morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's uh, research morning call. Okay. Uh, so today for we have a lot of stock counter updates and we'll be having the macro and sector outlook. Uh, okay, so without further ado, let us begin. Okay, so first of all, we'll be reporting the bank's earnings. First, uh, with you will be starting first. Um, for the third quarter of financial year 2020, we see it as a gradual recovery in income. Uh, fees and commission actually show some sign of recovery quarter on quarter. So this is something that you will see that is similar across the across the three banks as we uh, move on. Uh. So you can see that actually for fees and commission, uh, although it's about 7% down year on year, but it's a 16% recovery since a uh, second quarter. So the recovery has already begun. Uh. So that's the, that's the good thing that we are noticing for the banks. In terms of allowances, um, uh, the SP of 134 million for the quarter is also 19 basis points of the loan book. Uh, this is even lower than uh, what was observed a year ago. And this is considering that you're comparing to a pre-pandemic level. So right now, they are not really seeing any uh, non-performing asset formation, which is the MPA formation, uh, as a result of the pandemic yet because of the loan moratorium programs. Um, but this is still a good sign. And as a result, we see that um, in terms of their allowances, it brings up the total GP reserves to uh to GP reserves the coverage ratio to 111% from 96% uh, in the second quarter. In terms of the negatives, we see that uh, the interest income is still down uh, because uh, interest rates are still are still uh, suppressed. NIM was down 24 basis points year on year from 1.77% to 1.53%. Um, but we do note that there's a better liquidity management on the bank part. So we saw that. NIM actually improved quarter on quarter from 1.48% to 1.53%. So in moving forward, we are expecting the NIM levels to remain uh, between 1.50 to 1.55% 1 in 2021. Okay. Uh, in terms of the outlook, um, we see that for, for, for UOB itself, they actually guided for a lower credit costs moving into 2021. So we, first of all, something that is um, backing up their optimism is that the loans under their moratorium actually fell from 16% to 10% of their loan book. So 16% was the highest across the banks in the second quarter. Um, uh, was the, yeah, second uh, was the highest, highest among the three banks. And this sharp drop from 16% to 10% was actually due to the fact that uh, Malaysia, their Malaysian exposure uh, exited the loan moratorium program uh, in October. Lah. So what they saw was that is actually 10% of their loan book is currently under moratorium now. And most of them that have come off moratorium actually started repaying their, their, their interest. So this gives them hope, uh, it gives them the optimism that currently the loan book are all still very healthy and they hope to replicate it for Thailand and Singapore moving forward as uh, in January when, when these two economies uh, cliff off the loan moratorium program. So in terms of investment action, we are maintaining an accumulate call with a higher target price of $21.10. We basically just uh, forecasted for a lower credit costs moving forward and we peg our target price to the FY21 um, ROE at 0 0.89 times. Okay, uh, next up we'll have OCBC. For OCBC, similarly, like I said, uh, across the three banks, uh, first of all is that the non-interest income are recovered. For them, they actually recovered to pre-COVID-19 levels. Uh, partially because they have the life and general insurance, which actually grew 29% year on year. And trading income also increased $255 million year on year. Wealth management fee also recovered to pre-COVID-19 uh, run rate. So in terms of uh, when you compare it to UOB, uh, UOB's trading income was a bit lesser uh, quarter on quarter, but then uh, for OCBC, they did see that even their trading income was still higher than the previous quarter. And in terms of allowances, they also halved it. So what we saw that in the first half of 2020, actually for OCBC, they had a very high level of SP, uh, so specific provisions. So um, largely because of exposure in the oil and gas sector and I think, yeah, across the entire first half of the year, they were just writing down them, writing them down, sorry. And coming into the third quarter, we see that actually this has tapered off. They are, they are $148 million of uh, SP is like less than half of, yeah, less than half of uh, second quarter as well. Then the GP of 202 million is within expectations and total allowances is expected to stabilize at around these $350 million moving forward. 
in terms of the negatives, we saw that uh, net interest income also once again uh, is the is the tail uh, is the headwind for them. Uh, it was down eleven percent year on year on a twenty three basis point NIM compression. Uh, also fell to like one point five three percent, and their exit NIM of the third quarter was noted to be one point five two percent. So actually, the bank actually guided that in fourth quarter itself they are expecting NIM to possibly fall slightly below the one point five three percent that we saw in the in the third quarter. Next, in terms of outlook, uh, for it, comparable to UOB, uh, for OCBC, they had 10% of their loans under moratorium in the second quarter. And coming to the third quarter, after at the end of the third quarter, they saw that uh, the loans under moratorium actually shrank from 10% to 5%, also because of the Malaysian loan moratorium program uh, exiting in uh, October itself. Mm, however, they do know that uh, to them, they are not as bullish in terms of the recovery. They feel that uh, the conditions are just stabilizing, but then in terms of recovery, they might not be able to call that it is recovering uh, yet. So, uh, so across, uh, they are expecting their MPL ratio to come in at the lower end of 2.5 to 3.5% for FY21 um, instead of lowering the entire range. So they're just maintaining the same range, but come, they, they expect it to be at the lower end of the range. In terms of our investment action, also accumulate with a higher target price of $9.68. And for them, we didn't really change any estimates. We just uh, brought it forward and uh, peg it to the 21 uh, price to book value. Okay, for uh, lastly, for DBS, uh, also for their, for their recovery in non-interest income, fees and commission were up 17% quarter on quarter. For them itself, wealth management and credit card fees are particularly uh, notable. We do see that wealth management is already higher than one year ago. And for their credit card fees, it's still lower, but it's because I think we know that credit card fees, a lot of them spend on travel and currently travel is still down. So we are not expecting credit card fees to be higher than the pre-COVID-19 levels anytime soon. In terms of allowances tapering off as well. However, what we do know is that for DBS in the, in the third quarter itself, their SP came in slightly higher than expected uh, compared to the other two banks. And uh, this was, they, they noted that um, this was because uh, they did see some NPA formation across different industries. So it's not a particular strain in a certain industry, but just across the board, they see that there are some NPA formations. Uh, yeah. Sorry for the training income part. Sorry, it was supposed to be the first point. Yeah, the training income also helped uh, lift the non-interest income. It was up 11% uh, year on year, but down about uh, down 18% quarter on quarter because in the second quarter, we noted that they actually had a lot of, uh, we noted that they had a lot of uh, gains on investment securities that they actually realized to uh, stave off some of the pressures on the net interest income. In terms of negative, net interest income also fell 12% year on year as uh, NIM was compressed 37 basis point, but this was because DBS had a very high, higher base last year. I think last year when everybody else was reporting 1.8% in NIM, DBS was reporting like 1.9%. But what we do see now is that uh, everybody kind of normalized to 1.53, 1.54 level, uh, 1.54% level in this quarter. Next. Uh, yeah. Okay, in terms of outlook, uh, DBS do, uh, noted uh, they are expecting a swift recovery within the region. So uh, especially in India, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong. So they are expecting this recovery to support a uh, mid single digit loan growth in FY21, which will help to lift uh, your, both your interest, uh, lift your interest income, although there are some interest rate headwinds. Lah. So this will help to offset each other. However, we are still not uh, very sure whether this uh, mid single digit is uh, a, a very reasonable target. So we see that actually for Singapore loan growth is still negative year on year. So uh, mostly, so we really need to bank on the offshore lending. And of course the strong fee income recovery will definitely help to support uh, income for 2021. And in terms of investment action, we actually maintain a new crow with a higher target price of $22.60, which is up from $21 previously. And we are just also, we didn't really change our estimates as well. Uh, we just hold it and just roll it over to the FY21 estimates. So now I'll be talking about Singapore Banking Monthly. So just a snapshot. So actually this report was uh, uh, released before the results, but then I updated some of the some data. We do see that uh, in the in the 
third quarter itself, Nim actually came in at, in the table on the bottom right. You can see that Nim average Nim for the for the three banks are one point five four percent. And if you take a look at the table on the right hand side, uh, you can see that actually interest rates has kind of stabilized. Although it's at a one of the all time lows since two thousand thirteen, is already kind of stabilizing la. That's why we are also maintaining that Nim will probably remain at this level going into twenty twenty one. And in terms of loans growth, the one on the left hand side shows a longer term view of 10 years and the one on the right hand side is just this year alone. We see that uh, loans growth, the red color line is still negative in Singapore, which was why I was mentioning that uh, the fact that some of the banks are reporting 0 to 1% kind of loans growth is really held up by offshore lending. Yeah, uh, in terms of, but however, we do note that um, the consumer, consumer loans, if you see on the table on the right, is actually kind of trending back up again. So that is a good sign. Hopefully, it will continue this way to leave uh, loans growth like, in Singapore itself. Yeah, uh, but business loans have still been quite slow. Next. Okay, in terms of the capital market activity in October, the month of October, we do see that, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, we do see that SDAB was up 6%. Uh, although it's still a positive growth, but we do note that this is the slowest uh, in the whole of 2020. So whole of 2020 is all double digit growth. And uh, right now, of course, this will, we are entering the last quarter of the year. So usually it is slightly quieter in the last quarter of the year, but we, um, but this time around is slightly different. Uh, this, although we are in a holiday mode, but uh, most of us probably can't travel out much. So we are not sure whether this will help uh, the SDAV in the month of uh, November and December. In terms of derivatives, it actually, derivative volume fell 8.7% for the top five equity derivative products. Um, however, uh, and what we do note in the suite of derivatives is that SGX has continued rolling out more FUSI, FUSI products and they are all, uh, when you compare it to those that are expiring, the MSCI contracts that are expiring, they do have kind of like a like a one-for-one -one replacement. So you can actually see a table that is, uh, that is in the report that uh, most of the things that are expiring, they do have a replacement product, product that is coming out. And in terms of the, especially the biggest part, which is the Taiwan index futures, right? Um, if you take a look on the left hand side, uh, currently is ranked like third in terms of the volumes. But we do note that for the month of October itself, uh, the num the turnover for the FTSE Taiwan Index futures volumes right actually over to uh, the MSCI counterpart already. We were actually betting on bigs to continue going up uh, in anticipation of the elections, but then we do see that actually now the bigs have also tapered off lah, so it might not really help the derivatives going to the final two months of the year. So as an overview for the segment, uh, for the sector, sorry, uh, we saw that uh, the, for the all three local banks that have reported their results, their NIM levels were pretty similar. And we expect it to hold going into uh, FY21, which will be a hit win for their interest income. But the good thing was that non-interest income actually saw recovery across the board. Hopefully wealth management and uh, credit card fees will continue to recover and grow into 2021 to help uh, offset some of the net interest, uh, the interest uh, pressures. In terms of allowances, they also, all, all three banks are already kind of past the highest point in terms of uh, catering for allowances. And if according to their, according to their forecast, um, even though they are tapering off their, their allowances in 2021, the amount that they will taper off to will be more than sufficient to, uh, as in based on current reserves level, uh, they will be able to cover the non-performing asset uh, formation in 2021. So the outlook kind of will kind of brighten up a little bit for the sector, but we do note that we you know the recent uh, run up in share prices might have take, may have already been taken into account some of these uh, um, uh, better outlook that, that is out there in the market right now. And that's it from me. I'll now hand the time over to Natalie. Uh, okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'll be talking about Fraser Centerpoint's uh, full year results. So for a table, you can see that gross revenue actually fell by 16% um, year on year, uh, and net property income fell by 20%, 20 uh, DPU fell by 25%. So this was largely due to the rental rebates. So some 27.4 million worth of rental rebates for the tenants. Um, and also, but to a lesser extent, um, lower other revenue. So the other revenue comes from like atrium bookings, um, car park revenue, as well as um, some marketing revenue. So on the positive side, um, although occupancy 
um, of 94.9% um, is actually lower year on year. So last year around this time, the occupancy was about 96.2%. Um, however, this, this 94%, almost 95% occupancy is still uh, relatively high in our view. Um, and FCT managed to secure about 4.2% worth of positive rental reversions on leases signed um, in FY20. So tenant sales uh, also recovered uh, to pre-COVID levels. Uh, they have actually stabilized and maintained at around um, the minus 3.6% uh, range over the last three months. Similarly for footfalls, um, down about 38% over the last three months and has been maintaining at this level. Yeah. So one of the reasons for um, this discrepancy in the recovery of tenant sales versus footfall um, is that um, as work from home remains the predominant uh, mode, um, there actually is less transient footfall uh, in the mornings and in the evenings, um, visit uh, passing by, passing through the malls. Yep. So this this is the reason. One of the reasons. Another reason is that uh, tenant. Uh, Customers are actually becoming more efficient with their trips to the mall. So, because of the of the safe entry as well, uh, um, and all the various safety uh, or distancing um, measures, um, customers actually are trying to you know buy more over on one trip to the mall versus like coming back multiple times to avoid the hassle. So, on the negative front, um, of course, this is the COVID impact uh, from from. Um, this, I mean, this this financial year there was COVID impact, um, and and the negative is that um, our DPU was hit. It, it was it was hit, and the MPI also was hit. Yep. So in terms of outlook, um, FCT is going to employ a differentiated strategy um, at, under the realign framework. So for uh, FCT will categorize tenants into three broad categories. So the first one is for tenants who have been trading well and are continuing to trade well. Uh, and then after that, secondly, tenants who are, uh, sorry, for those tenants who are have, have traded well and are trading well, um, mostly those that are in the essential services um, uh, trade sectors, they will be, FCT will endeavor to offer them the uh, traditional three-year terms on, on the leases where you know the base rent is uh, the, the mix up the bulk of the of the of the rent. Um, for tenants who were affected during COVID nineteen and are now trading better, um, FCT will attempt to retain these tenants uh, and you know offer them a shorter lease of six months um, for them to still trial trial and see whether they can return to pro profitability. And so for the last. Uh, category, which is tenants who were affected during COVID-19 and are still face uh, affected and have not recovered significantly, um, then FCT may actually uh, enter discussions for with tenants to exit the malls. Yeah. So this actually allows FCT to take back the space um, after the tenant has made good or restored the property and then after that um, remarket it to any potential um, tenants. So the realign framework is also um, very similar to this, um, you know, just biting the bullet and letting the, ten the tenants and the landlord experience the pain from the termination and then move, all move on, move forward um, with more productive leases. Sorry. So um, second of all, of course, um, in terms of outlook, we believe that dominant malls will be prioritized. Uh, FCT's portfolio of heartland malls are actually located within one to three minutes of uh, transportation modes. So while retailers who may still be under pressure are, are re-evaluating their, um, their consolidation or downsizing of their operations, um, we believe that FCT will be prioritized um, by tenants given their favorable locations as well as um, the ecosystem um, of their digital loyalty programs, etc. So uh, we are upgrading to buy uh, with the unchanged uh, target price. So our upgrade is mainly due to the recent pullback in share prices, which presents a better entry, uh, total returns of about 31.5% uh, according to our target price. So of course we remain resilient, uh, we remain confident of the resilience uh, of necessity driven suburban malls. Um, next for menu life. So this is Manulife's um, third quarter um, update, and I did no, no financials were actually uh, provided in this update. So this was a very slow quarter for Must, um, with no new leases signed. Um, and on a positive front, um, rental collections actually remain relatively high at 94% for the quarter, 
uh, year to date, the collections are about 98%. Rental deferments and abatements have been kept at a minimum, um, at, at, a, at a minimum, um, was only 0.3% and 0.2% respectively of YTD's uh, of year to date uh, revenue. So some, we are expecting about 3 million worth in save, interest savings uh, upon refinancing of the debt that's maturing in FY21. So in FY21, uh, about 26% 20, of debt uh, will be expiring or rather maturing. Um, and this, this debt uh, borrowing is carrying with it about 3.2% interest. And Manulife recently uh, refinanced some loans at 1.85% um, interest rate. So there's actually a more than 1% uh, interest interest rate savings here yeah, that would translate to about 3 million worth of interest savings. So on the negative front, um, portfolio occupancy dipped um, slightly from 96.2% to 94.3%. Um, and it, this is largely due to known expiries unrelated to COVID-19. So um, in one of their buildings, so um, this, this mainly came from two buildings, uh, one tenant each. So for one of the tenant, one of the buildings, um, this was because of consolidation uh, within, um, so one, one, one real estate player bought out another real estate player um, and therefore uh, that resulted in, the, in a non-renewal. Um, and then another, another one was a, a marketing, sorry. Yeah, one of the tenants who decided to change their business model a healthcare firm that changed its business model. Um, for the outlook side, uh, there, there are still some headwinds ahead. Uh, for the US market, uh, you know, tenants are, are increasingly trying to uh, take uh, renew a, a, on a shorter lease term. So for example, if they previously were signing seven to 10 year kind of leases, they would now opt for five year leases. Um, if they were signing for five year leases previously, they would try to sign for a shorter three year lease. Uh, on top of that, they have tenant incentive and rent free expectations have increased. So they are, the tenants are trying to have, um, get more bang for their buck and you know, get more freebies. Sub subletting within MU Must's portfolio was unchanged at 3.3%. So this sublet subletting is basically um, your existing tenant actually going back to the market and releasing your space, the space that they have rented from you. So this will this subletting space will actually compete with the, the menu life's um, supply or rather the, the kind of um, compete with menu life's own stock that they are putting on the market. The, yeah, so subletting is generally um, uh, uh, also increases the supply in the market. Um, however, the, the subletting within menu life's portfolio is unchanged. So that is a mild positive. Uh, and we see that there are growing desires to return to the office. Um, and as seen by the uptick in physical occupancy um, of 13.5%. So um, this still lacks um, the kind of physical occupancy we see in Singapore. Singapore, we're kind of around 30%. Um, yeah. However, this 13.5% in October is an improvement from June's 12% as well as um, March 5%. So overall, we're maintaining a buy with a higher target price. Um, this is due to incorporating a lower cost of debt on the, on the refinancing in FY21. Um, so we like many life because of the long wheel and the long wheel which actually uh, provides short, uh, very little lease expiries for the upcoming financial year so only about 6.7 percent of GRI will be expiring in FY21 so year to date uh, rental reversions um, have been positive at 7.9 percent um, and many life will uh, we are forecasting a DPU yield of 8.75 percent for many life so last of all um, for, all, for those of you who have uh, actually helped us out with our survey, thank you. Uh, and for those of you who have not yet helped us, please do. So this is a survey about the to get to get a feel of the retail market as well as the office market. So um, this each survey will take about three minutes, and you will help us by informing our view on the outlook of these two sectors. So please help us if you have not, and if for those who have, thank you so much. I'll be passing on the time to Tia Hui. Um, thanks, Ned. Okay, next we have Prime's third quarter update. So generally, it was a pretty resilient quarter for them. Um, the results were largely in line with expectations. The numbers for 9 month 20 outperformed IPO forecast due to the acquisition made earlier in the year. But in terms of quarterly numbers, you can tell from the table on the right, yeah, um, this has actually uh, been largely stable. And this is actually due to high rental collection rates at 99% and minimal deferrals granted to tenants. This, um, they also have minimal expiries coming up and then this will actually provide um, 
greater visibility for Prime's income stream for the next two years, you can tell. As in like FY20 and FY21, I think the total um, expiries are only 10.7%. Yeah, so next. Okay, um, the second positive for them is in terms of leasing strength. Their leasing activity was still strong in third quarter. In 3Q alone, they actually leased out half the space they leased out um, year to date and at positive rental reversions of 8.9%. Over 60% of the leases signed year to date are actually renewals or expansions by, exi by existing tenants. The lease terms and duration signed um, sorry, yeah, the lease terms and duration that they have signed remain largely similar to that of pre-COVID, with less than 10% of the leases signed um, being short-term leases. Okay, so negatives-wise, we saw a dip in overall portfolio, port portfolio occupancy. This is largely due to a natural expiry at Tower 909. The occupancy actually fell from 94% to 90%. But for this building, um, Prime did mention that he actually received leasing interest from a major tenant that is looking to expand. So yeah, as in we are hopeful that this is actually just a temporary adjustment. Additionally, um, the vacancies that were left last quarter at Village Center Station 1 and 17117 Street, um, they are actually yet to be filled. And so they are actually operating at, operating at below um, average portfolio occupancy right now. Brian mentioned that for both properties, um, they actually receive leasing interest from both uh, tech and the finance sector. Um, particular, particularly in 17117 Street, uh, you actually saw more interest from tech tenants, especially after Microsoft moved into the building right beside it. Then for Village really Center Station 1, it saw interest from um, companies who were looking to relocate to Denver. Next. So in terms of outlook, um, moving forward as remote working becomes a more integral part of this new normal, Prime believes that um, workplace collaboration will become more crucial to the relevance of office use. And um, in the near term, it's actually working with tenants on their return to office, but in the longer term, it's looking at restructuring the office to fit the future needs of tenants. Yeah, they actually have quite a number of lunges uh, yeah, in, um, in their offices. So they are looking to convert it into collaboration spaces collaboration spaces for tenants. Yeah, next. Okay, um, on the acquisition front, Prime has been looking at a number of um, opportunities in the markets of Atlanta, Salt Lake City, and Philadelphia, which are areas where uh, they already have presence in. And although we're seeing more deals out in the market, there has not been any distress selling to be able to buy quality buildings at a good bargain. Yeah, but however, their um, capital management still, still continues to be prudent. And this helps them to yeah, as in to look out, as in this will help them as they continue to look out for more acquisition opportunities. Yeah, so in conclusion, we maintain a buy rating for Prime at a target price of 94 cents. The current price translates to a dividend yield of 9.6% and a total upside of 34.1%. Yeah, this is all from me. I'll pass my time over to Timothy. Uh, thanks, Yehui. Uh, pardon the renovation noises if you are able to hear it. So I'll just go through a short uh, comment, credit commentary on the Starhub, FCT, and Capital Land, which Starhub and FCT will be covered today uh, for the equity side also. So next slide. Okay, so just a short commentary on the credit numbers and also their bonds. So for Starhub, there's little change in their credit uh, performance for the year. So uh, last year, from last year, uh, fourth quarter 19 to third quarter 20, uh, this year, year to date uh, figures. So gearing, uh, the borrowings increased by 12.6%. Uh, this was due to slightly more borrowings in the year. Uh, but the gearing wise, uh, it remains quite stable. It increased only about 2.1%. This was due to a higher asset base. Also the liquidity profile actually improved uh, quite significantly. So at the, at, the, at the end of 2019, it was at uh, 0 0.29 times cash to short-term borrowings, but now uh, cash to short-term borrowings is at a huge 23.2 times. So the short-term liquidity, uh, no worries at all. So the in interest coverage ratio also fell a bit uh, by 1.4 times. So it, it fell from 8.6 to 7.2 times, which is still very healthy. And their operating cash flows also remain healthy, uh, up 32.6%. So if you look at the uh, Starhub bond, because of their quite strong credit profile still, it's, it's trading at a yield to call of 2.57% for their 3.95% perpetual bond. So this 2.57% yield for this bond is actually trading uh, 
we think it's trading relatively low to the dividend yield of the startup, which is 3.96% at the moment. So the call date for this bond is 2022. So uh, we, we see this bond as uh, trading really tightly at fair value. Okay, next. Okay, next is Fraser Centerpoint Trust. They also re uh, released an update as, as what Ned went through with us just now. So the borrowings actually increased by 20% uh, over a uh, year on year. Uh, this was due to their acquisition of ARF malls. So, but the gearing increased lesser. So it increased only by 3%. This was due to a higher asset base. Interest coverage ratio also fell a bit, uh, but it's still healthy at 4.95 times. Although you can see that the operating cash flows fell by quite a lot. Uh, this was due to the rental rebates given to their tenants. So currently now for their bond, uh, the 3.2% the bond, which we are looking at, uh, there's no sellers for this, uh, but the, the previous yield to call, uh, when, when there was a seller, it was at only about 1.78%. Uh, this is really low compared to the dividend yield of FCT, which is 4%. So we are... Uh, currently, no, no price indication for this bond. Uh, next one. Okay, and lastly is Capital N. Uh, this one is really healthy, gearing credit, credit profile still. So you can see that nothing changed uh, year on year. Uh, from the start of 2020 to now, no, none of the gearing didn't really change for their uh, debt, the, debt the debt ratios. But their interest coverage ratio fell from 7.6% times to 4.8 times. Uh, this is in line with the retail malls uh, and the retail sector and all the, all, uh, also in line with Fraser Centerpoint Trust, which also the interest coverage ratio also fell. So we're, if we're looking at the, the perpetual bond, which is 3.65%, the user call is 2.56%. Uh, this is trading really tightly, which is uh, relatively low compared to the dividend yield of capital N at 4.58%. Uh, this the call date is at 2024. So we look at the perpetual bond mainly because uh, the senior bonds, uh, usually you have to look at the really long tenors ones to, e to even get above 2%. So you can see that uh, for these thermostic link companies like Starhub and capital N, uh, all their bonds are trading uh, relatively low at this point in time, which is also good for them because of their because of their lower interest expenses. So uh, going more in depth into the valuations, uh, next slide. Okay, so some uh, some relative valuations for the bonds. For the left-hand side chart is for Starhub. So you can see that uh, Starhub bond is trading uh, relatively in line with the peers, uh, Singapore Technol uh, Tele Singapore Telemedia bonds and also the Singtel bonds. So it's actually rel relatively in line, slightly below. Uh, so, uh, with regards to valuations wise, we think it's fair value. Uh, for capital land, you can see that the bonds are trading really tightly to the curve. So you can see that none of the bonds are trading way above the curve, which is uh, more attractive. So it's it's really all at fair value at the moment. Or so then we can see the outlier, which is the perpetual bond. So uh, what we think is that uh, if if you want to look at the for for bonds with these uh, thermostic link. Uh, for, for these thermostic link issuers, uh, you can look at the perpetual bonds. So for the Starhub bond, the 3.95% uh, uh, perpetual bond, and also for the capital land, 3.65% perpetual bond. So these actually give you a decent yield of about 2.55% uh, for these thermostic link bonds. Okay, so that's all for me. I'll pass my time on to uh, Paul. Oh, okay. Thanks, Timothy. Um, I'll move on to Starhub's uh, third quarter results. So the the, uh, the the title was Border Closure Still Hurts. Uh, so as the name implies, the, the earnings in summary is still going to be hurt so long as there's no roaming revenue. Uh, next slide. Okay, if we look at the, the table, uh, before we go to the positive and negative, look at the table, the, the main uh, source of weakness for Starhub is uh, the mobile line. As you can see, uh, revenue is down almost 30%. Uh, the main reason is if you look at the postpaid APU, which is basically selling prices, uh, the monthly you know, charges that we all of us pay, uh, is down 25% and it's at the record low for Starhub. I think a few years ago, uh, I think four or five years ago, maybe 
the ARPU was between 60, 70 dollars. I think right now it's 20 dollars. So you can see the extent of the decline, maybe worse than broker commissions. But okay, anyway, uh, let's move on to the, the positives. So the positives for, for Starhub was the other two divisions, which is pay TV and broadband. So the ARPU for pay TV actually rose. So this is a, uh, and also for broadband uh, rose even higher at 7%. Uh, if you look at the positives, uh, uh, the reason for the rise was because there was less discount and promotions. Uh, these discounts and promotions uh, were, were, were rolled out because as you uh, can recall in 2019, uh, all, most of us migrated our startup plans from cable to fiber. So in order to incentivize subscribers that migrate you know, to use your broadband so that they don't get leakage of customers, uh, they, they wanted to, to they had a cheaper promotions for broadband and and pay TV. So right now, all these are running off, and and it's good and, and uh, it's helping out in terms of the in terms of the, the revenue. As you can see on the table, sorry to move back on the table again. The pay TV, you can see the quarter and quarter improvement in uh, revenue. So so the higher apples will help even those subscribers maybe a little uh, lower. Uh, in terms of negative, I think we mentioned uh, apples is the problem. Uh, sorry, uh, mobile is the problem. So, so there are two parts of the weakness in mobile. Uh, let me mention the postpaid apple is down twenty five. And the other part uh, is also the prepaid customers, uh, which is actually down a huge hundred and eight thousand uh, quarter on quarter. It's, it is down uh, actually thirty three percent year on year, uh, which is a huge number. I think because there's there's fewer theories and theories though, that come uh, usually turn on. Uh, no, they will subscribe to some of these prepaid uh, numbers. Okay, in terms of the outlook, uh, um, in terms of, we did lower our revenue because uh, there was just some just some modeling things that we did, uh, just reshuffling some of the revenue components. Uh, but strangely, of course, we actually raised our EBITDA, but it's mainly to include the government grants. So for this year, uh, government grants is roughly around thirty million. So we incorporated another fifteen million into our our forecast. Uh, in terms of out, uh, outlook, uh, the other divisions, it looks. Uh, um, Better. I mean, the next quarter, the, we are in the third quarter. So the next quarter, December quarter, you will still see big numbers because year on year, no, a year ago, you had tourists and, and roaming and this year you don't have. But we think from 2021, maybe there could be a, a, a slow in, in, in the improvement will, will, will come back in. Uh, not only for mobile, uh, sorry, and also the enterprise should also improve because as projects resume and the economy recovers. Uh, the other thing that, that happened under our outlook commentary is that uh, the customers are transitioning better than expected to 5G. So there is a, uh, the uptake from niche customers, you know, those who like to watch a lot of uh, video, I guess, maybe Korean, I'm not sure, but uh, watch a lot of content and also uh, gamers are take, sus subscribing more to uh, the 5G content. So that's a positive. Uh, we are still keeping to a neutral. I think we are still using a six times EV beta, but I think if we move forward, uh, the, the valuations will start to look more interesting. I think. Uh, 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 but, but just that near term, the earnings momentum will be weak. I mean, so long as the border closures are, are happening, I mean, ne next quarter I'll still be talking about the same thing, you no know, weak post paid apu and, and weak prepaid. So uh, you're going to expect the same commentary from me next week on this. Uh. But until then, you no, know, there's still little signs that the international travel can recover and, and then you can uh, get uh, an uplift in roaming. Uh, the, just as, as a side note, the two key countries for roaming, you no, know, like customers, like Singaporeans going leaving the country or you no know, or tourists or business of foreigners coming in will be of course Malaysia and China. So if there's some restrictions lifting on these two key countries then that will definitely help uh, the roaming business. Okay uh, for UG uh, our our title uh, one quarter um, beat one year basically uh, this quarter earnings beat the whole of last year. Uh, yeah just one quarter uh, next, next slide. Okay, if you look at the the, the results, uh, um, revenue was up uh, 170. I mean, almost tripled. Uh, pet me, uh, uh, we couldn't calculate anymore like, how much the year on year, so it just put not meaningful. Some I don't know how many X, but uh, okay. The main reason why the numbers did well was uh, meaning selling mainly uh, selling prices. As you can see, gross margin shot up to 70 percent. Uh, so if you look at the positives, uh, the higher ASK basically selling prices. Uh, the volume growth was about high teens, uh, but if you look at the revenue, it jumped 170. So obviously most of it came from higher selling prices uh, due to, and some of the countries that did well for them was Europe, Germany, UK, you know, Brazil. And more important for us is that uh, Brazil and China, because uh, emerging markets will give you 
uh, faster growth than you know, some of those developed countries. Although right now, uh, with the pandemic of uh, uh, Europe, or demand will be higher. But I think in, in terms of the next one, two years, because of the low penetration, Brazil and China are very key markets for, for them. Uh, gross margins, uh, gross margins, you know, record high, maybe better than Apple margins. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I need to go and check. Out, but you now these are like incredibly high margins. Uh, you sell gloves, right? 70%. Uh, the, the, the main talking point is the increase in nitrile raw materials. So uh, uh, no, they, they sell 50, you know, roughly 50, 50 nitrile and latex. So nitrile is synthetic rubber. So in the industry right now, there's some worry about the rise in nitrile prices. Uh, but you know, nitrile, Raw materials only account for 45% and 13% of their sales. So even a 10% rise month on month, you will only shave margins 1%. You know, they got 70, so they got more than enough to cover. And more important is uh, prices are still rising. I think even if we move into November and even December, I think price, uh, selling prices are still rising. So the following quarter should you could even we could even see quarter on quarter growth in the December. I mean, because prices keep on rising. Uh, in terms of the negative, uh, I think this is more accounting wise. Right? There was some uh, uh, um, uh, higher effective tax uh, because of, but all this is, uh, is small numbers compared to the profits uh, to the profit. And so I won't go through too much on that. These are more like a bit of one offs there. Uh, in terms of out outlook, uh, I mean, FY21 is, is obviously very strong. So for us uh, to, to do a proper valuation for this stock, I mean, we want to look at the normalized earnings. So what we did was we took FY22, that means the, the following year, which is FY22, June 22, because they are a June year end. Um, so for, for that, we benchmark our valuations to that. And uh, and if you look under the, the outlook commentary again, uh, we, we took in what we did was uh, FY22, we, we assumed uh, a decline in ASPs, a drop in margins. and But what, what most important for FY22, uh, it will be supported by a 50% jump in capacity. Yeah. So, so the setup is quite good in the sense that uh, although uh, the earnings may be may, may have may, may peak, I'm really not sure, but the earnings, if, if you assume the earnings peak in 2021, uh, in 2022, you're going to get a 50% jump in capacity. So that will help sustain some of the gro growth or even if there's uh, any tapering down. Uh, in near term, we expect the, the second quarter earnings to even rise because growth prices are still rising. Uh, we may maintain a buy and our target price is we are just using a 30% discount uh, to the big four, which you know the thick top top glove, and, and because this has been the rough, roughly has been forty percent, but I think with the better numbers, I think we is I think is it's worth checking them at uh, pegging them at thirty percent discount. So again, uh, just to, uh, as a reminder, we are valuing them more on normalized FY 21, uh, 22 earnings, and we should really incorporate a lot of uh, uh, no lack of better word conservatism in our numbers. Okay, uh, next next slide. Okay, uh, venture. Um, before you ask me why the share price went up so much, I, I, I'm not. But frankly, the earnings was really quite a disappointment. I should even, maybe should be even shorting this thing now. But okay, uh, in terms of the results, uh, if you look at the the the, the revenue, it was actually down six percent year on year. Uh, net, net profit was down uh, also six uh, percent. Um, the the positive was margin was stable. I think even though revenue was down, they they still managed to keep margins. I know usually there's some scale impact if revenue is down, but uh, that didn't happen. And what we think is that it's likely due to the higher mix of life science, you know, uh, medical products that they continue to emphasize. They, especially, they explicitly mentioned, you know, there's no re results briefing from them. It's just a couple of slides that was provided. So in their slides, they just mentioned that um, ventilators and PCR equipment uh, was also one of the drivers to revenue. So they are definitely, benef uh, not benefit, I mean, they are, um, they are producing equipment to cope with the, the pandemic right now. Uh, in terms of revenue, I mean, we were probably a bit too bullish. Uh, we expected a 12% rise. Uh, the reason was we thought that the second quarter, any there should be some spillover from second quarter, um, just as a refresh. In the second quarter, because of the Malaysia MCO, uh, some of the factories were closed. And because of that, no, there was some, probably they lost a couple of weeks. So we thought that could, could recover into the, that would spill over into third quarter. But it seems that the third quarter orders were actually even softer than, than, than expected due to macro headwinds. Um, okay, in terms of outlook, the way we, pose, we view this stock is that you know, since the earnings peak in FY17, the, this, the earnings has actually gone nowhere, actually keep continue to decline. So, so what we worry is that there, there isn't seem to be any new projects that cannot trigger any growth, 
uh, to kind of beat their yeah, record in FY17. So this could be you know, a, a, a slow creeping decline in, in earnings uh, without any you know, specific large projects for them. So moving into 2021, uh, we, we think there will be a recovery uh, because they did mention some new products and which is likely healthcare, uh, including COVID-19 related products. And of course, the overall improvement in macro will be the driver. Uh, we still maintain a, a neutral. Uh, we cut our FY12 earnings. Uh, we are rolling in our target price to FY21. Uh, and again, it's all based on historical valuations. Uh, but I think what is helping the stock for us at least is that at the current price, which was 1982, was because of the dividend yield of 4%. So they still pay very health, you know, reasonably attractive dividends. And also, you know, this is all supported by very strong uh, cash net cash balance sheet. But we just, what we worry about is the growth trajectory. There doesn't seem to be any major triggers for growth for them since they are peaked in 2017. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. Okay, we just uh, go through our usual VT. Uh, it, uh, we, we kind of uh, did less this week because you know, we've got so many results. Right? So uh, uh, we just run through some of the macro that came out in Singapore. Uh, the retail numbers was actually quite soft. Uh, we, we were down 8.1. We thought it should be improving, but actually it got worse from August. Um, the bright spot was supermarket sales. Uh, probably this is less meaningful because Sing Song results is out, but uh, what's important is that it just shows that even as we exited uh, the third quarter, the re re supermarket sales are still very, very robust. Uh, this is 20%. Historical average supermarket sales for Singapore the last, I think, three years, I think uh, five years, I think, only grew about 1%. Uh, so 22% is like 20 times faster than historically how supermarket sales had grown uh, in Singapore. Uh, move on to taxi again. Also, the numbers were softer. Only month on month, only moved uh, two percent. Uh, as we highlighted uh, a few few weeks ago, I think it will only be a fourth quarter that we could see domestic Singapore or you know taxi traffic and so on improve, because it's only in the fourth quarter that the group restrictions you know the only started to really ease more significantly. Okay. Uh, uh, in the next one will be on, on our PMI numbers. I think the PMI came in about, uh, the, the was the highest in, so the good thing is that manufacturing is, is, seems, is doing well. It's the highest PMI rate in 18 months. Uh, in terms of US, I think we, we know the main event, no? Thanos got defeated. Uh, but in terms of the, the Federal Reserve, uh, we can see that uh, the commentary from Fed Chairman Power was there's still two key risks to the economy, the rising pandemic and household savings. Uh, without any fiscal measure, he just worries that you know, the, all the savings that was accumulated during the fiscal boost uh, a couple of months ago in March could, could kind of be whittled away. Uh, and I think his essential message was he's willing to buy more bonds across the whole curve uh, if the economy starts to, to weaken. Okay, in terms of tactical, for us, uh, I know banks is the highlight and we you know we, we returned more positive uh, last week and we think the, the setup for banks looks still look good. I think firstly, of course, like uh, Vicom mentioned, the results are better than expected. I think key for us will be, um, it seems that there's a peak in the provisioning cycle. I think the, the banks seem to have front loaded a lot of the provisioning. And as they roll this up back, this will be good for the market. Uh, the third point is that, you know, Singapore stands out in, not only in Asia, I think even globally, especially the developed markets in terms of managing the pandemic, and that will be helpful in terms of a relative comparison in the in the growth compared to other countries. I mean, if we can control, we're managing this pandemic much better. So the growth outlook vis-a-vis -vis other countries look to be better, be it in Asia or, or even developed countries. And the fourth point is that uh, this, for us, the, in terms of the setup for the banks, you know, the improvement in the local economy uh, would only mean that any worries of the, that the, the MES might impose their dividend cap could be removed. So if that is announced, you know, they could see another pop in, in the share price. So that's why we think uh, the setup for banks in general is good. Uh, in terms of the US elections, um, the, the main thing now is the January 4th, there will be a Senate, uh, there will be a runoff in Georgia to determine who is the, because there's two, two more seats. So it's 50 for Republicans, 48 for Democrats, if I'm not mistaken. So Georgia is the main one. Uh, the key thing is if Georgia wins the two seats, say of course 50-50, but uh, as we all read for the newspaper, if there's a 50-50, then the vice president, and we know who that is now, uh, will decide. So it will be positive for the Democrats. So hopefully Georgia, you know, the Democrats can win, then we can get a major fiscal stimulus in the next few years from the US. Uh, near term, uh, you can forget about any stimulus. I think uh, uh, with the lame duck White, White House, uh, Mnuchin is not going to negotiate. Uh, probably nobody answering his call now, but uh, and, and then the demo 
Democrats have to uh, negotiate with, with the, 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 the with McConnell, uh, which is the, the Republican head. So I think that won't happen because the, the gap between the Democrats and Republicans was even further away than, again, so, than compared to the White House. Okay, uh, in terms of the weeks ahead, I won't drag too long this meeting. Uh, uh, the key thing is our opponents will be now. So this Venus, this week, uh, we will Wednesday and Thursday, we will have UG Healthcare and then followed by Jaffa. So uh, please register for that. On the 24th, I think that will, this one will be of more interest, I think, since a lot of people have been asking us about MedTech, which we do not know what they actually do. But on the 24th, probably all of us will start to know what they actually do. Uh, so on the 24th, uh, we managed to secure a webinar with, with, uh, with MedTech. Uh, so please register for that. Uh, it may not be in the poems yet because we still have to upload it, but, but we are lucky to get them. So, uh, so do register for that. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, just again, uh, again, we always do uh, get an update on the pandemic. It, it is, there's no good news here, it continues to accelerate. I think a week ago, we were looking at 58%. Uh, so right now, global cases is rising almost 70% month, month on month. So we are, we are hitting that 510,000 per day kind of average. Uh, one in one week we had like almost you no know, Singapore kind of population like 4.6 million cases in one week, and then the US is facing you now this. You look at the orange line, the US is getting another uh, third wave, and and not sure they want this record, but they are, they have a daily world record 118,000. I think now hitting 120. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of the, uh, Europe, uh, I think not much. I think we know. In the, uh, I won't run through this because we mentioned it uh, more last week. Uh, next slide. Okay, in Singapore, the, the good thing is the community cases continue to dwindle. I think the last seven days we had one, uh, uh, and then the prior week we had two, so it continues to be well, well contained. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, I think this one I'll skip, I just, just for, for everyone's reference. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, this is just for, for everyone's reference that uh, it, we are still climbing back up to pre COVID levels for taxi. As you can see, the pre COVID was about 180 in terms of. Uh, average monthly travel kilometer. So right now we're 140. So it's still taking time to climb back to pre-COVID levels. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, this is just for our references, is our PMI. And the good thing is it's the highest since 2019, uh, early 2019. Uh, next slide. Uh, this again, just for everyone's reference, I know the, the results. So coming up next would be uh, uh, Asian Pay TV, Comfort Delgro, and, and Propnex and so forth. Those that we cover are in, in yellow for your, for your reference. Next slide. Okay, I think that comes to the end, and uh, we we are, uh, we'll free, uh, feel free to uh, post any questions that you may have uh, under the Q and A. And, and thank you for listening. Okay, I'll start off with the questions from my, from the banks. Um, I'll take the second one first because I think the first one takes into account uh, SIA and the property sector. I'll, I'll address it last. Uh, the second question we have here in the outlook for your three banks, there seem to be no mentioning of competition from digital banking on the future business of these three banks, would they have no impact on the big three going forward? I wouldn't say there will be no impact, um, but then even, okay, so we know that the three banks have already have a head start on digital banking, uh, on digital banking for, um, uh, against their competitors that are coming in and we are not even sure who are the competitors that will be actually getting the license. Uh, as of right now, we still don't know the results yet, um, but we are expecting the results to come out uh, actually by the end of this month. If I'm not wrong, um, and and definitely you see that during the lockdowns and everything, the the digital banking uptake uh, in the three local banks are so much higher. So uh, I mean, it is kind of uh, not really like a win lose situation. It's more of a win win situation because uh, of course, first of all, it will help the the current banks that are already having the digital banking side that or you know to onboard clients or to the digital banking side. Um, but then of course, um, because of this, as more people get to know, um, get to know how to use digital platforms to access banking services, then when new licenses get released, then of course the newcomers may also get the benefit as well. So, so ultimately, um, I don't think that it is going to be, a, uh, they are not coming out to compete directly with one another. There's still some niche that maybe the local banks aren't in yet, that the small players can, can uh, take can take advantage of, but even then, um, the local banks are definitely far more prominent in the space as of right now. So as of right now, so we are not 
we are not expecting it to be disrupted at least for the next one, two years. It's not going to come into picture anytime soon. Um, for the question, second, for the, let me see for another question. Okay, there's a question on DBS. DBS current price now is already $22.90 above the target price. Still good to buy now. Uh, I think generally the, the, the outlook for the three banks are almost the same. And, but what we do think is that for DBS, in terms of valuation, it seems to have run up a little bit more compared to the remaining two banks. So it is still a positive outlook. And of course, when people are expecting the dividends to be lifted again, then DBS will definitely provide the highest uh, recovery in view because uh, they, they have a, they have like $1.32 per annum, as you 28 cents per quarter in dividends. So that's something, sorry, sorry, 0 0.33 cents, 33 cents per quarter. So that is something that, that is something that uh, will have a uh, upside. But then until we know actually that MES come out and say that, okay, we'll not uh, stop the banks from uh, going back to their previous previous dividend, then that is still something that to take note of because if it goes any higher and at the current dividend level of 18 cents per quarter, it is like 3% per, yeah, 3% view. Yeah, and let's see whether there's another. Okay, so the other question that we have is what is the short term outlook for property, SIA and banks in the Singapore market? So short term wise, like, uh, like we say, uh, definitely for the banks uh, in the next quarter, there still shouldn't be anything to worry about. But of course, we will be taking a close look at the loan moratoriums. So we know that entering uh, 2021, the Singapore loan moratorium will shift towards a more targeted one, uh, whereby they they only offer they will they will be offering extension to those that are more vulnerable, uh, vulnerable sectors of the economy. So that will uh, even uh, show us a better understanding of how much of the loan pool are actually most likely going to turn or possibly turning into N, uh, NPLs. So the banks, they did come out and some of the banks came out and say that usually the translation effect. So if I have $1 billion worth of uh, uh, pro probably NPA, the migration will take note about 30% of it will go into it. And based on the current reserves level, they have enough. So whatever additional um, allowances they are that they are going to take up in FY2021 is actually more of continue to add only to add on buffer. Yeah, it, it will only strengthen their capital positions. Yeah, for fallout. Yeah. So 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 definitely nothing to worry about for the banks in the short term. Yeah. And yeah, just how fast the recovery of uh, non-interest income for them. Yeah, and that's it for the bank side. Uh Malin, Ned, you want to take the property side? <clears throat> okay, hi. So the outlook for property, um, I guess we look at it from the different the, the different sectors within property. So we know that um, for residential sales, um, I think it has been rather the residential, um, also known as the development book, um, is actually doing relatively um, good. The sales have been healthy. Um, whereas the rest of the segments, such as the retail, um, industrial, even, and lodging. There's been some headwinds, and overall, in the in the le on the leasing front, I think all the all the subsectors um do face some leasing headwinds, um, mainly to do with the weaker sentiment in the market as well as the, you know the, the companies actually holding off on expansion plans, some looking at consolidating or downsizing. Yeah, so I guess um, I think what we look what we look out for is um, it really depends on the. The property developer on the on the breakdown of revenue between these segments. So of course, I think a, a more well balanced uh, developer with uh, equal weighting in each, um, or yeah, equal weighting in each um sector would be more protected, in a sense. Yeah. So um, yeah, for that's our view on the property sector. Yeah. Uh, let me just try on on SIA. Um, we, we, I tried to register again. Uh, uh, to their briefing, uh, so they they rejected me. Although I told them I was Chris Fire member, but um, I, I'm I will wait for the because they will post that their conference call, so I'll hopefully give you more details. But uh, it it the share price in the sense, despite the record losses, it, it still looks uh, resilient. Uh, so it comes to it seems to be that uh, you know whatever pandemic, whatever weakness that we all see, and pretty obvious, it seems to be quite priced 
into the market. So even though they announced such a huge loss, uh, the, the share price actually still went, went up or even was quite stable. So in that, in that sense, uh, the, the, their book value about $5, it, it, it looks interesting in that sense, but again, it's more of a trading anchor than any fundamental view. Uh, in terms of, of cash, fl cash flow burn, uh, the first half cash flow burn was about almost two plus, two plus billion, or almost hitting three. Uh, and they got like net cash about seven billion, so they I think it looks okay in that sense that that that, that but my uh, my thoughts are just that I think as we move in the nearer six months and you know this thing won't improve, they might probably issue another round of uh, mandatory uh, convertible bonds, but that may not actually hurt the share price. It might just uh, because the conversion of this is like ten years away, so that might actually you know, kind of build another round of financing and and maybe uh, support and confidence in, in SIA. So it looks to be kind of like you know, bottoming out at these levels. Even though the, the price action, even though there was such a huge loss, but now the price action was actually up. <laughs> so uh, again, this is just my own view. I don't really, uh, I don't really cover them, but it looks okay in that sense. Yeah. I'm not sure if that helps, but I need uh, this is my feedback. Okay, uh, we, uh, you want to take that? Uh, then the next are all a lot of uh, T, T, A, T, A questions. Okay, so for the question on view on CDL Hospitality Trust, so we don't have coverage on CDL. Um, however, uh, we can give some broad commentary. For CDL, HT, I think um, their, their portfolio is predominantly um, hotels, which number one, have a higher um, break-even cost. Uh, and also bring even occupancy um, as compared to service residences um, and generally more cyclical in nature. So I think for, for hotels, their break even um, occupancy is around 50% and above. So anything below that, they are actually um, barely, barely breaking even or even in the red. So for CDLHT, um, actually 70, um, slightly above 70% um, of revenue is actually from uh, master leases so that actually provides us the, the bulk the stability um, and I think they are quite heavy in Singapore yeah. so in terms of the performance we, um, by geography uh, Singapore and New Zealand uh, they only have one asset in New Zealand um, so Singapore and New Zealand are actually the two countries that they are doing the best in um, and this is largely due to the alternative revenue alternative incomes from government bookings yeah and that, that has really um, sort of um, helped them but I think overall, the headwinds for the hospitality sector do persist. Just, just the same um, situations, um, like for example, your the resurgence in COVID cases, as well as, um, yeah, yeah, as well, and everything just hinges on the recovery of. I'm sorry, the the vaccine timeline. But of course, um, the positive thing is that a, a lot of its uh, CDLs portfolio is actually located in Singapore. And as we know, Singapore, um, with very low coast case counts, um, we will likely be one of the economy, uh, countries to actually open our borders. And uh, we, we know that Singapore has been working hard to you know, discuss uh, these kind of green lane, fast lane kind of arrangements with many countries. So if anything at all, uh, CDL's uh, larger exposure to the Singapore market will be um, beneficial for, for, for CDL HD. Yeah, hope that helps. That's all for me. Uh, passing on to Weyren. Sorry, thank you, Nat. Uh, so uh, there's two questions. So one for Sheng Chong and ISBN. Uh, personally, I don't really have very much. Uh, I, uh, by the way, can you see my screen? If you can, just uh, do a hands up. Right, thank you. So um, yeah, okay. So you can raise. Uh, I mean, you can see my uh, screen. So uh, for I for Sheng Chong, I think uh, I caught a short last time, but uh, if it fails to break below one dollar sixty cent. Therefore, um, I think price is going to be test uh, the resistance at one dollar and seventy five cents. Uh, reason being, this is a very major resistance, which is uh, the previous left shoulder. So if this level fails, then there 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 will be a chance of it uh, falling all the way to uh, I mean uh, one dollar fifty two to one dollar fifty cents before we go. Uh, it's very tricky. So, but given the strong momentum today, if we can end end a note with a strong bullish candle like this. Then I think that uh, for the next few periods, then there will be up uh, trading the upside. Uh, minimally, we'll be seeing one for one dollar eighty two cents being tested. All right. So uh, the next one is um, um, ISDN. Um, ISDN previously, I think I, I mentioned that um, there's a head and shoulder. So 
and then uh, there's a sh the, the price actually rebounded strongly off the support zone. Um, and then currently, I think the diamond pattern has already like been invalidated. So right now it's forming a light uh, a pattern. Uh, it's like or you can call it a symmetrical triangle. So um, key resistance zone between zero point four three zero to zero point four four five is actually a key resistance zone to be tested. So given the strong momentum, once it's been broken, I think we are we are see, we will be seeing an, an immediate upside in turning of the uptrend. So you look at the the cloud um, that uh, although the Senko span A has really crosses below uh, with a lot of like um lagging um a bearish indicator but uh given the fact that uh is a mixed signal from the cloud from the whole five indicators of the Ichimoku there um we, we are seeing that uh it might be ranging for a period of time. Alright so um that's all for ISDN. So for the next one um let me see the next question. So then, okay, so the next question will be uh UG Healthcare, Sun Power, and Yang Zixiang. So um uh, due to time constraint, I'll share a few. So for UG, not much. Um uh, since it bounced off from, from the support zone at 0.875, uh prices have a strong bearish and golfing candle over here. So um there is a there's a like an inside bar, but the not very strong one. So uh further action need to be uh need, further candlestick action need to be uh confirm to determine the action again. And then uh, I'm quite positive on some power uh, based on the weekly chart. Um, resistance zone has been tested more than uh, four times. And then we are seeing that uh, there's an upside already. So we are seeing uh, potentially a very strong upside to your was uh, 810 perhaps. And then you look at the daily chart, right? Um, the dark cloud cover was, uh, was actually, uh, what do you call it? Okay, so the dark cloud cover actually uh, was invalidated by the inside bar over here. So this is a very strong uptrend. And then you look at the cloud on the daily chart, uh, I think it's strongly pointed on to the upside for now. Okay, so uh, for some power, uh, I, I think that tomorrow there will be upside. All right, so if this bullish candle remains as an inside bar, I think I will go on to upside. So I move on to Singtel. Singtel perpetually downtrend. Um, Key resistance level, um, there's a like some sort of like a quote unquote double top, and then um, it, it has been rejected uh, twice already. So, if this candle, re um, I mean, resume as a, a, a bearish uh, inverted hammer, then we will see a go further downside for Singtel. Then, <coughs> then, next one will be uh, Capital Land. Uh, Capital Land daily chart, uh, although there's upside on last week. Uh, price still maintained below 2.65 to 2.68 with uh, resistance level. Right, so I hope that answer your question. Thank you. So uh, next one, I pass back to Nat the question. Thank you. Uh, uh, the question is on uh, view on Lenly's read. Okay, um, sorry. Yeah, uh, we don't cover Lenly's read, so we don't have a rating or a target price for it. Um, they released their, their first quarter results recently. They didn't provide any like revenue numbers, but we can give you like a bit of color. Um, their portfolio actually comprised of two properties. So firstly, like they have their commercial properties that um historically makes up about 30% of the revenue stream. And then um this is actually a very stable part of their portfolio. Uh, because this is actually 100 percent leased to this um very big broadcasting company until 2032. So it's actually a very, very stable component. And then the other 70% of the income stream is derived from 313 which, uh, as you know, is actually hit by COVID um, due to like, the social distancing measures and work from home measures, and work from home. Uh, yeah. Then um, I think the good thing about the mall is that it's still quite supported by local demand. And then the tenant sales and visitation actually recovered back to like 70 and 60% um, levels respectively. But I think um, one bad thing about um, their recent announcement is that um, they're, even though they are occupancy still remain high about 99%. Um, they actually recorded double-digit rental reversions to, as in double-digit negative rent, rental reversions um, to fill up the occupancy. So being, moving forward, right, um, there's actually about 12% of the leases left um, in the, yeah, for the fiscal year to, to be leased. And we are actually expecting about double-digit rental, negative rental reversions uh, for the bulk as well, which will impact like the REITs income levels. Yeah, that's all from me. Oh, uh, next question is for me. Uh, last report on EC World was released 15 May 20, 
uh, 20. Do you have a latest update to share? Is it still a buy? Uh, so for EC, well, actually we have sort of dropped coverage on the counter. Um, I guess uh, the reason for the dropping of coverage is mostly because so we can free up our resources to cover other counters, which I think we have, we would like to have more um, coverage on uh, certain, certain subsectors, I mean. Yeah, so for EC World, I think, um, you know, as you know, most of their leases are actually with the uh, with the uh, sponsor uh, on Master Lease terms with step ups. So uh, there's quite a bit of uh, income protection there. <clears throat> And so their EC World will be releasing their results um, actually um, tomorrow. Yeah. So that, that's, that'll be their three Q results. Now. So what, what we have is what we know is from um, the two Q, two uh, one H um, period, uh, second quarter, up to the second quarter. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, so 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 nothing not, not much um I think for EC World. Uh. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, so I uh, move on. Then the next question is uh, Capital Land More Trust. Capital Land More Trust, you can read my report on the 1st of October. Uh, I think it's still valid. I think price, the uh, short price actually with my support zone and then rebound thereafter. So uh, updated. Um, I think uh, today there's a 1.91, 1.95 resistance going to be tested. Um, price level will might make the correction down uh, back to the support zone at 1.7. 3 to 1.77. Uh, if this support zone uh, do not hold in the mid term, then we will see more prices getting more to the downside. Okay, so uh, the next one will be uh, Center Street. Okay, so a Center Street, same thing. Uh, there's a, actually like a head and shoulder formation. Uh, not really, not quite a head and shoulder that I like, but, uh, but it's still a head and shoulder. So, uh, Prices uh, is, is struggling. Uh, prices have obviously returned back to the three dollars psychological level, um, and then there's like a false breakout at three dollars, and then prices close at two forty seven. Uh, but prices still maintain at the sell zone at three dollars and twenty uh three dollars I mean three dollars twenty three cents. So therefore, I think that if prices fails to clear above three point two six, then we will see a short term correction um down downward. So. Uh, Central Street, you need to be more uh, cautious about it, uh, more things will be needed. So, uh, HMN is uh, okay. Escort Trust. So, for Escort Trust, um, you can be sure that, that there's a, that's a like, wedge, wedge like pattern going on. Uh, so, we are looking for like a reversal pattern, but uh, how strong a reversal, we are not sure. So um, I'm betting on a buy lower at 0.790. All right. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is uh, top close and reverse zone perhaps. I think all will be the best customer answer. Thank you. Um, compare. Okay, I'm not sure what it means. Is it a FA or D? Is because compare in terms of uh, um. Okay, the I guess the comparison. On a fundamental basis between the three uh, UG top growth reverse, of course, the size is the one difference. I mean, top growth is the largest. Um, and probably the product mix and the model. So, for top growth, uh, I know probably going to confuse everyone, but uh, top growth has a mixture of latex and nitrile. Uh, so, so uh, latex is no natural rubber, no nitrile is synthetic. Uh, synth uh, synthetic is mainly used in the US. Uh, you know, the developed markets use that. Uh, likewise, late, late taxes. Oh, okay, then on the um, probably confuse you again, but then on river stone, river stone is more on nitrile, and it is more, uh, more what do you call it, uh, uh, more electro, more dependent on. Uh, it's hundred percent nitrile, and it's more dependent on, uh, and they got half the business from uh, electronics, which is their own brand, and they got very strong uh, stronghold on, on of this of this of this business, so they are the leader in that. And that is important because during the week time, no, during the last few years when when the, when rubber glove prices were weaker, uh, uh, their prices are more resilient. So for you no, know, because clean room, clean room or electronic makers are not going to keep on negotiating. You know, if there's a small one or two dollar change in price. So even though times when the, uh, ASP, so they're more like a more resilient model for Riverstone. Uh, the, the prices are more. It doesn't drop as much compared, or of course, it doesn't rise as much as compared to the rest. Yeah, I hope it. Uh, whereas for UG glove, they are like a river stone. Uh, they are sorry, they are like a top glove in terms of they have latex and nitrile, 
but the defense, of course, don't talk about size. Uh, their production volume is probably like one month of top glove. But uh, the, the the key thing for them is that they, they have their own distribution. So they invested a lot of money to, to build their own brand. So 80% of their sales is through their own distribution network, uh, through their own product. So that's why uh, there's a question on the performance. Uh, so so the, the two, sec if you look at the report at the back page of my report, there's a year-to-date performance of all the glove makers. Uh, so the big ones that did the, in terms of percentage gainers, the big one was a Supermax, uh, which is do, planning to do a dual listing here in Singapore. So the difference is the Supermax has a distribution. So they are similar to UG in terms of the distribute. That means they actually have their own warehouse. They have salespeople to go knock on the doors of, you know, of all these hospitals and so forth. Uh, uh, so that helped them in terms of picking up more margins because distribution also the margins exploded. Huh? Uh, so that's why this, these two segments uh, did well compared to Riverson. Riverson is more, more very resilient. If there's any uh, downturn in glove, uh, they are the most resilient because uh, their electronic glove prices hardly change. Uh. So, so when raw materials are down and so forth, their margins are always really much, much better than the rest. But in this, when an up, of course, it works the other way. When there's an upcycle, then uh, the, the delta or the, or the jump in growth is, is less than the rest. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm not a very complicated answer. So, sorry if some of you can't really uh, pick that up. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. The three banks again. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, I think the next question is I understand banks are sector. Oh, that is two. Okay. Uh, hi, three banks compared to mid term buy. Buy, to buy for midterm, which bank is a uh, top pick? Currently, we have a uh, UOB on our top pick. I think generally, it's just the valuations. Uh, currently, I think DBS has already um, been fully priced in. And in terms of what we understand across their uh, earnings results, right? It seems like it seems like UOB has is turning more more optimistic compared to the other two banks, whereby they are not that um, they are not that certain of they are not as certain that the credit outlook will be better in terms of uh, first of all so for dbs like um, we saw that for ocbc and UOB, the malaysian exposure dropping off actually showed them that how their how their books are going to look like when their loan moratorium for singapore is going uh, when when the singapore loan moratorium ends however uh, that's not the case for that's not the case for that's not the case for dbs because they do not have exposure in malaysia so they can they can't tell but of course, when you take a look at the amount of reserve that they have in preparation for this MPA formation in 2021, all of them are about at the same level of uh, comfort. So, so generally, I feel that uh, in the sh short term, because of how the valuation plays, like uh, I feel that um, the I feel that uh, UOB is better in the short term. Then there is also I understand banks are cyclical. So if Economy that don't improve, price will lag behind. So it definitely, uh, definitely we are banging on the recovery of the economy to help put some uh, safety net on, uh, safety net on the on the non non performing assets. Uh, but and it will definitely be a front runner in the sense once it recovers, it will benefit them a lot. But once it, anything goes back, they will be the first to take the hit. Yeah. So. I feel that currently the, the fact that we are in the immediate term, like we are looking at a better economy will definitely help the Singapore banks. And that's the two questions from the banks. Let me see one. Yeah, and, and, so, and, and just, sorry to interrupt, just as a reminder, I know there have been some glove questions. Uh, you know, just as a reminder, uh, on the 11th, on Wednesday, 1 p.m., we have a webinar with UG Glove. So if any questions, uh, especially these tough questions, which I cannot answer, which is mainly most of them. Uh, you can just post the questions to to UG themselves. And so, if you really need to know more, uh, and and sorry because for all these uh, listed company webinars, uh, we don't do a recording, not because we don't want to, but you know because it's, uh, some of these list schools prefer not to have a recording. So, but uh, feel free to register and 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 attend and and ask any questions that you you like. To. Yeah, just wanted to remind everyone. Yeah, that, thank you for that. Uh, next one. Uh, next one is, uh, uh, okay, I'm not sure this is the TA or FA question. What's your view on STI index? Um, we, we, 
uh, I I I think that, um, not like uh, STI index is, is almost like a bank bank banking index, uh, like forty percent banks. So with the rebound in banks, I think the index should have a slow and gradual recovery. Uh, I think in line with the pace of how the economy is, is opening up. Um, that but it will not but it may not reach the pre-pandemic. My, this is my own guess. Probably. 10-20% of the economy is still out there that because of the no travel, no international travel, that will be that will that may kind of suppress the the, up, the rise in the STI index. But it, it looks to have bottom and with banks recovering, that, that should be helpful. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, uh, Paul, can, can you comment on uh, direction of US dollar SGD pair going forward uh, post-election? The the number looks, I mean, um, SG, it looks good for the sing dollar. I think in, in line with our views that because of the way the pandemic is the trajectory of the pandemic is getting worse in the US. So there'll be one one trigger. Uh the the the, the second second trigger is you know the US elections uh, with, with the Biden victory. It's not only good for Singapore dollars, good for all uh, Asian uh, Asian con Asian currencies in view of you know the be you know uh, the, politically, the for, their foreign policy will be less aggressive, so that is positive for all Asian currencies. Uh, the own, uh, and also the other thing is that MAS, of course, has a neutral view on on the Sing dollar now, so that is also kind of suppressing the Sing dollar a, a little bit. I think then if they if the economy gets better, then they might kind of uh, resume their upward trajectory for their for the Sing dollar. So the Sing dollar looks good, but I think the RMB looks even better because. Uh, you no, know, the RMB ten-year bond yield is about three percent. You no, know, best the US is 0.8. and you no, know, the way that uh, China is handling pandemic, growing faster. So I mean, on paper, I don't know a currency, expert, but on paper, the uh, Chinese RMB looks even better because there's a there's a interest rate carry. You know, uh, you, uh, you know interest rates in the ten-year bond yield in China is, is a huge three percent. Whereas you know that like, in the US is only I think 0.8 now or points. I think 0.8, 0.8 now the ten-year bond yield. Singapore is also around 0 0.7, 0 0.8, so not much there. But at least in China, you get this yield pickup, and that could kind of attract more flows mm -hmm. into into the Chinese currency. Okay, I hope that helps. Um, next one is on REITs. Yeah, we, we probably try to end this uh, another five minutes because I think Baron has another call. Um, the question is: Do you see REITs recovering? Uh, with increase in COVID uh, caseload, I'm guessing. Uh, okay, so um, I think it's true in the, in the, in the past few weeks, the REITs have actually uh, suffered some, some correction, some uh, downward corrections. Um, but that's it. Um, that, that has a, a lot to do with, I, I guess, the, you know, Europe side going into lockdown again. Um, and definitely in the near term, um, there has been some, uh, that has caused some jitters also, not, not to mention that um, there has been some leasing headwinds, um, as mentioned, for some of the subsectors like your retail, even your industrial, and um, yeah, even the, the yeah, retail industrial, um, and you know, the, the ref pass are still quite um, down for, for hotels. So I think in the long term, um, in this, in this lower interest rate environment, um, we do believe that actually this is the prime time for the REITs to shine. Um, even if they are not going to acquire, even if the even if the um, property markets remain um, relatively frozen, um, because of the REITs, uh, the way the REITs are managed, where they actually average down the cost of debt, that will actually provide some sort of uh, you know lower refinancing and and um, for the REITs, uh, and that will help them in, in a way. Um, not to mention that actually a large portion of expenses actually come from uh, finance finance income. Uh, but I think in the long run, um, or the in the midterm at least, uh, we do think we do believe that the REITs will will recover. Yeah. Um, I think the next question is for Terence. Uh, what when do you think capital price will recover to levels before since the market backed out of the deal? Uh, as as we as we wait for for Terence, can can you just move on to the to the to to this last question then before we take the last one. Uh, uh. Chun can you help on this the 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 impact yeah. on tax sector with the Democrats back in the White House? Thanks. Yeah, sure, no problem. So, yeah, so I'll I'll take, take the question. Yeah, so, so, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, 
No worries. Uh, so the question is, uh, should we invest uh, China tech stocks in uh, US or Hong Kong? Probably I will speak from the, the US uh, point of view. Uh, of course, when we have uh, Democrats in the White House, I mean, a key concern is that with a blue wave, uh, is Biden is able to push through with his stance on breaking up the big tech, right? But ultimately, uh, currently, because, you know, our market is factoring in a state congress, so his approach to actually breaking out all these big tech is, uh, is less likely. He may face uh, further challenges. So that is why uh, there is this uh, optimism around uh, tech itself. And another uh, catalyst which I, which I believe is that, you know, um, without a blue wave, we may not be seeing a near-term uh, fiscal stimulus or a fiscal uh, relief stimulus, which may, which may help the more of the value stock. So all those value stocks are uh, near-term, they, uh, they may still remain under pressure. I mean, of course, currently now the whole market is uh, optimistic over this uh, certain, uh, certainty over the US election result. But moving forward, wise without a fiscal stimulus, I believe that you know value stocks will still be under pressure, and then the attention will still be shifted towards uh, uh in terms of those uh, growth stocks, which is uh, mainly uh tech sector. Yeah, so that's my take. And in terms of Hong Kong, what I can um what I can input is that uh of course we all know that you know uh Biden's Biden's stance towards China is uh he may not lose his stance, but his stance is in is uh in a way more open. And then his approach to doing it, doing it is through a negotiation, as compared to you know uh, Trump, which is more who is more aggressive. Like maybe you know uh, Trump, we have seen that uh, he just gave a one week notice, and then he wanted to ban like uh, WeChat or something like that. So uh, we may not see this for Biden. So Biden may be a more open and a more negotiable uh, approach, which may remove uh, less uh, uncertainty in terms of the tech sector itself. So that could be, uh, that could ultimately uh, aid, uh, provide a near-term catalyst for, for the Hong Kong tech stocks also. Yeah, so that's my uh, take on it. So I think we do have a US uh, seminar at uh, 1 p.m. So I mean, if you are, if you are free, uh, do, do join uh, for that. So for now, probably we will end off uh, this uh, seminar because we actually have to prepare for the uh, US seminar. So uh, thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you again. Yeah.